record. And um, so if you do need to leave for whatever reason, just know that by the end of the week, you'll get a, a, a link to the recording so you can listen back to anything that you may have missed or if there are certain things that um, little nuggets that you want to come back and listen to, um, it will be available. <coughs> for you. Bless you. So um, feel free to ask any questions. We do want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, so feel free to utilize the chat. It's already got started with some of the music that was playing in here. So um, get comfortable and let's get started. So uh, we are, this Pendorama is a Pendo takeover and I have um, brought two amazing speakers to provide additional details on like how we're utilizing Pendo. Um, when we look at pandemonium data um, and uh, surveys and even Pendorama surveys and everything like that, you always wanna know how we're utilizing Pendo. So that is what this Pendorama is all about. So um, for whatever reason, when you join this uh, uh, Zoom, it's not automatically putting you on mute. Uh, so just know to put yourself on mute if you haven't already. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. So first up speaking, I believe is Marcus. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. And hello, everybody. Um, if we haven't met or if you don't know me, I'm Marcus Andrews. I'm the Director of Product Marketing at Pendo. Um, and yeah, I think um, when we first started talking about this, we started talking about like um, what new features or uh, fun new stuff we could share with you all. But uh, I think we, there's actually been a fair amount of that lately. We did Pandemonium wasn't too long ago. And then there was Customer Forum not too long ago, too. So I was trying to think about what would be uh, interesting for you all. And we've been in, we've been doing a lot of work, like looking at like how people are using Pendo and how our customers are using Pendo um, right now, because there's so much changing in the world of um, software and technology and product management. Uh, and I think that's the thing that I think is really interesting. Um, how, you know, with everything that's happening in the um, like macroeconomic uh, climate and with like uh a focus on efficiency and like whatever is happening at Twitter and FTX and like all of that, like how, what does it mean for um, PMs and how, and how you might use Pendo to like achieve outcomes. So I'm going to give you a little update on that today. I hope it's interesting. Um, I know there's some power users in here. So I think I'm hopeful. I'll, maybe I'll show you some stuff that you're not super familiar with, but maybe not. Uh, but I hope it's inspiration and, and interesting. So it's a smallish group. If you have questions while I'm going through it, um, you can put them in the chat or we, I guess we can do them afterwards. Probably Erin would tell me to do them afterwards, but, um, all right, she's nodding. So do, we'll do them afterwards. Um, okay. So I'm gonna share my screen. I've got some slides I'm running through. I'll show you some product and we will, um, pick it off. Okay. So this is, um, from a report we did, but basically, like I was saying, there's a ton of change right now. Uh, macroeconomic headwinds valuations dropping, layoffs and budget cuts, crypto collapse, Twitter chaos, you know, like it's, it, they're really interesting headlines right now. I hope mean that they're not interesting if you had tokens in uh, uh, FTX or whatever it is. I mean, there's a lot of bad things that are happening, but I think what, what we're interested in is how does that then like affect the product builders and like our jobs and what do we do and how do we, how do we do our jobs best? And like, I think what it, what we're really it comes down to in a lot of ways is that like product teams need to there we're under a lot of scrutiny right now and i think being looked at and examined and i think you really have to um be focused on business outcomes right so like stop fish shipping features not literally but start shipping positive business outcomes um so how do you have a bigger impact on your business on the things that are like core to your business right now in new ways that uh, help you become more efficient or do more with less or grow faster. These are the sort of things where we're seeing a shift in how people are using Pendo uh, because growth is a little bit less important. Efficiency is more important. Um, so to help figure this out, we ran this big report. It's a real interesting piece of content, um, but we ran this inefficiency report. And what we did is we went out to like hundreds of um, product leaders and we basically asked them like, what are the most inefficient parts of your business? And then 
we try to figure out how people are using Pendo to solve those inefficiencies. Um, so there's a bunch of them. There's 10. I'm going to cover like my like three of my favorites. Um, and I'll try and point out some ways, you know, you can use Pendo to do this and show you some stuff in the tool. Uh, but I think um, the all almost all of the ones that I'll, I'll share are problems where you sort of have to like go and figure it out with another team, you know, and I think that's just like probably preaching to the choir, but uh, product managers and, you know, the teams that use Pendo, I think are generally really cross-functional, but like if partnering with your customer success teams or marketing teams or revenue teams and trying to figure out like how to have wins together that impact the business uh, are what we're seeing, you know, is really in, in important for product teams. So, okay. So the first one, the, maybe the biggest inefficiency is support related, right? Like, um, especially, I mean, every company, um, you know, has customers obviously, but like, especially in software companies, technology companies, reoccurring revenue, um, you've got software, com you've got customers and, uh, those customers have questions. They need support. The typical answer for how to get them to support is to have humans, have a place where they can outreach to those humans and then they can get help. Um, a lot of the times this is really manual, really repetitive, and just overly reliant on humans to solve really basic problems. Uh, you know you have this problem if there's a high volume of repetitive tickets that have a long resolution time, you've got low customer satisfaction, you've got growing co uh, support costs. If your company has any of these issues right now, and everyone has some level of this, right? Like sort of a spectrum. You might have a lot of it. You might have a little of it, but it's out there. If this is one of those things that you can circle and say, like, how can I, how can I connect with support to try and fix some of this? Because it is as much as it's a support challenge, it is a product challenge and it's an issue to own because obviously people are using your product. Um, there's lots of ways to do this. And what we see the most uh, people using Pendo to do it is that they're using product analytics to identify friction inside the product, combining it with user feedback and like circling those really big generators of support tickets, um, using the product analytics to dissect it and really dive deep into it, right? Like not just going surface level, level but trying to really use data explorer and figure out like what is going on. Um, the other thing that's very effective is like solving issues before they happen. That's the best way to but like to, if the support ticket never exists, that's the obviously the best solution, right? And you can solve that with code, or you can try to help people nudge users before the hap before they uh, before the issue happens with in-app messages, right? Tool tips, guides, onboarding, all of these are uh, tools for you to try to combat this. And then resource center is probably the other most common thing, right? Like an amazing resource center gives people a way to learn, educate themselves, um, always on solution to help them. Uh, but one thing, or I'll point out a couple of things here. Um, you know, one thing I think that's overlooked a little bit with the, res with the resource center is that a lot of it, I think a lot of people look at it like, okay, this is a, my reactive support tool. And I would love that, like, you guys tell me if I'm wrong or like, if you have ideas here too, or we're not. Like, I know our customers have amazing solutions here as well, but a lot of it is like, okay, I want to submit an idea or I want to search for help articles. It's like the in-app, how do I get reactive support? But some of the things that I love and I'd love to see in resource centers are when you put in like, you know, I'm going to put my onboarding into um, the resource center. So like if people are new or if people forget, or if I haven't been in the app for a long time, I can go through the process of creating a new opportunity and it'll jump me into guides in app. Um, same thing with product announcements, you know, having ways to learn that aren't just like reactive support where people can go into the resource center, center and figure that stuff out. I love, I don't always see that in resource center, um, resource centers. And then the other thing is like, you know, this is just a basic tool tip that's like trying to get out there in front of issues. Um, and the other thing that like we see just a really, I hope everyone on this pro on this call uses it, but we see like a really underutilization of conversions um, and convert tracking your conversions of like, it should just be a, a you know, hopefully it's a part of um, your process. I think when you're thinking about guides, uh, they should always have a clear goal. Like, you know, it's like, hey, we're creating this guide because we're trying to change a user's behavior. 
like that's the like what is that behavior change we're trying to change like what is that behavior we're trying to change I think it's a really good question during guide creation um and even if you're like oh we need a guide because um we just need one because this thing is real confusing I think asking that question sort of a forcing function to get people to like think uh do we really even need the guide should we what should be the result of the guide and then tracking the conversion you know like saying okay we want people to view this page or click this figure or trigger this track event after they see this guide and really using that. Um, I'm just like, I, I love it as a feature. It's really simple, uh, but it's underused. And so, you know, I imagine people use it in this group, but I just want to encourage it and share some inspiration there. Okay. So that's my first one. That's sort of the, um, my, my favorite one, because it's just such a good place to jump in and have an impact, right? If the company has challenges around support tickets, really good place to jump in and have an impact. The other one is um, churn, uh, high unpredictable rates of customer churn, customer dissatisfaction, uh, sort of in this new world that we're in, like you can't have a leaky bucket. Um, if you've had any of those, if you have a a funnel that isn't, uh, you know, patched up and tight and you have customer issues. And again, this is a spectrum. Everybody has it, right? Or a continuum or whatever. You could have, the, this could be a big issue or it could be a small issue, but everybody's got some sort of uh, churn and lack of customer success at some, some places. Uh, but these are, these are things you really have to patch up and fix and figure out right now. Um, and some of the things that we see that are symptoms of this, like you don't have the ability to identify at-risk customers or users um, at scale, uh, you have high customer churn, um, or you don't have great adoption of the products that you build or you buy. Adoption, we know adoption is a leading indicator of churn. If people don't use the product, they're way, way more likely to churn. And if they use the product, they are more likely to upgrade too. So adoption is one of like, um, we have the data on that that shows that it works. Um, Ways to solve it in Pendo, obviously, again, leveraging product analytics to identify at-risk users, at-risk accounts based on usage, um, using in-app surveys to find qualitative feedback like NPS, feedback collection. It's going to help you keep a pulse on customers, understand what they need, what they want, if they're happy, if they're not. Um, and then using guides to increase awareness or action that increases adoption. Um, the one thing I'll highlight in app two. I'm, again, probably sure you all know it, but uh, with PES, product engagement score, you set up your core events, your aha moments. You say, these are the, the core things that we know people need to do inside of our app to be successful, to, to find success. Um, you can filter it by accounts. So, you know, you can look at different accounts and you can say, all right, across all accounts, this is the average I'm going to look at my different apps to say like, okay, where there are differences in PS across these apps, but especially helpful, um, I think by the account view, because if P if you, if you get PES to a place, you get your PES to a place where, um, which one oh, this is, uh, it's a really helpful tool being able to filter by accounts. You can see the different engagement levels and it can just give you a quick understanding of like for what apps um, people, where people have challenges. And I know there's like, it's not implementing PE. I'm making it sound easy implementing PES. I know it's challenging. There's a lot there, but I just love it as like a quick score, especially if it becomes like a language inside of your business where people can talk about PES in a way that like is easy to understand. Because a lot of the times, like, you know, adoption um, and usage is like a little bit loaded or complicated. And so like trying to simplify it and help people understand it with PES, I really love. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'm going to keep going really quick. My last one is, Aaron, I got a thumbs up from Aaron. Okay. Uh, the last one I'll share is that like, there's a lot of, um, you know, the growth motion for a long time has just been really uh, inefficient for a lot of software companies. Um, we, for our, as an industry, are just overly reliant on sales humans and advertising um, and email to grow our companies. Um, and if you can, anything you can do to make that motion more efficient, uh, you're gonna help the business a ton, right? Time is money in sales. 
And so like, if you are spending less time and seeing better results, like it's more like you're a better salesperson and it's more efficient for the business. Um, that's this, that's why there's this bad clip art here with the clock and the money. Yep. Um, so how, you know, you see this, <laughs> I, it's my clip art. I found it, but it is, it isn't bad. Uh, but how you know that like the symptoms of this problem is that like, you've got, you know, there's a slow sales cycles with too many one-to-one -to -one touch points. The only way for your prospects to see the, or experience the product is to talk to a seller, which slows things down. Your sellers spend too much time delivering real basic initial demos. Um, and as product owners or what the product can do to help solve for this is if you create some sort of product-led tactic, like a self-flighted tour, a free trial, a freemium product, it allows people to explore the product before buying it, understanding the value, trying it, using it. Um, and then you can do some fun stuff, right? You can implement a lot of uh, PLG growth initiatives with Pendo, right? You can use product analytics to uh, look at users' behavior in your free tool and uh, build models that say like, okay, these people are qualified or based on this usage, uh, this segment is a segment that like is uh, one that we should reach out to and try to, to push to sales. You can use in-app messages to suggest new functionality, things that are an upsell, um, ways to get them to have a conversation, uh, the right people to have a conversation with sales. And you can also do a lot of nurturing in app. So I'll show you how we do this in Pendo. I'm gonna share a different window. Um, let's see, this should work. Yeah, but this is, you know, this is this is Pendo free. Um, obviously we've got like a nice um, CTA and kind of add here. And then you'll see just like uh, throughout the product, you know, are like, these are our upgrade points, like resource centers, a premium feature. And I guarantee there are companies who do this, uh, you know, better than us. I'm not saying we're like the best, but I'm, I'm proud of what we've done here where it's just like real simple mouse overs, tool tips that help you understand what the premium feature is really quickly. You can see something about the product. Um, you've reached a premium feature. Hey, what is this thing? And like, how can I understand it quickly? Um, and then the clear, simple CTA, right? I want to start a trial or upgrade. Um, you know, we use Pendo um, to do all of this. Um, you have to give people, I think, a valuable free product, which I feel like we've done, where there's still a ton you can do with our free product. Uh, but it's limited with uh, the you know amount of users you can have and some of the premium features. And then kind of the cool thing that we are able to do then with the data, like back to what I was talking about, is um, we can use Pendo to really understand usage and then push those customers um, to the sales team. So that is the model I think that works really well where it's like not, it, it's, it can be different for every company, but it's not no sales team. It's not like no all product that's doing all the selling and all the upgrading, but it's also just not like all uh, salespeople. It's like the RoboCop uh, combination, right? Like half man, half machine that RoboCop was, that's he's half man, half machine. Uh, that where like the, the two can combine and then you use the data to really get the right people to sales. So um, this is the, if you're interested in the whole report, there's a good PDF on it. You might have already gotten it or seen it, um, but you can take a picture of the QR code and get to it. And um, that is uh, what I want to talk about. So that's all I've got for you today. Thanks. Awesome. Well, we do have one question, which I'm going to actually make it a two-parter. All right. Um, so Jesse asked, uh, could we have conversions as an option in adopt? And for those, just if you could explain what adopt is for those that might not know what that means and then answer that question. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, just like um, engage is our solution for product builders. So if you're building uh, products for customers, you're building a software product that, you know, you're then selling to customers like Pendo, like we build products that right? Um, engage is our solution for that. And so it's guides and analytics and feedback for that audience. Adopt is very similar, but it's for the, the people and for, it's for companies and the products that they either build or buy for their employees. So adopt, um, if you have Salesforce and you want to make sure you're 
sales team is using it properly and you want to understand how they're using it, you can use Pendo Adopt on top of Salesforce and you can see how people are interacting with that internal software. And then you can also put guides in the product to help onboard people or train them or make sure they're doing some certain process. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think there is a similar with both of those products are like purpose built for those audiences, you know, so that's how they're different. And I'm pretty sure there's a similar um, it's either being worked on or uh, it's live already. Um, there's a similar product with with an adopt or a similar feature with an adopt that's about workflows. Uh, and that's what um, they think about then. So it's like, hey, I want all of my employees to make sure where they're staying like compliant. So I want them to go through this specific workflow. Uh, so thinking about the workflow that you want them to go through. But yeah, I mean, having conversions, um, being able to measure if people are, are taking the behaviors you want them to and adopt makes a ton of sense. So, um, uh, nice. Well, and then we got one more adopt question, um, is can adopt be used with Microsoft CRM solutions or just Salesforce? It can be used for anything. So, um, it could be a tool that you buy. It could be a tool that you've built. Um, just like you can put Pendo into any software and you'll have, you know, analytics and guides for your customers, you can have adopt on any software and you'll have analytics and guides for um, that internal audience. So Salesforce, we see a lot of, you know, um, but we also see it for lots and lots of different tools that people buy. We also see it for, you know, a ton of tools that people build for their internal teams. Perfect. Awesome. Well, Marcus, if you don't mind taking Jim's question in um, the chat, or um, just because we are at time and we are going to move on to Erica's session. Um, so you're up, Erica. All right. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Marcus. That was awesome. I feel like it goes a really good tee up to my presentation, um, which is seeing a lot of some of these things that um, Marcus talked about in practice. And if you were at my pandemonium um, presentation, then there's a lot of follow-up and results related to some of the things that we've done. So if you weren't there, that's okay. Um, it's very similar information. Um, I want to start just by talking about what scale customer success means. So I'm the manager of our scaled customer success team. It means different things to different organizations. But for us, that means that we are utilizing a multi-channel um, approach to the customer life cycle. So our goal is essentially to recreate what a CSM would do, but utilizing a digital one-to-many or a product-led motion to create value um, at scale. And even though we're targeting customers more um, down market or customers that don't have a dedicated CSM assigned to them, we are still um, impacting those customers regardless of segment or spend. So a lot of what we do is you tailor, tailored for smaller customers, but it can be benefit across all customers. So how we do it, um, just really quickly, we use data for everything that we do, um, product data, you know, our data from our CRM. So we're it's informing all of our programs and the things that we're trying to um, impact. And then we create that strategy of like, is this better for in-app? Is it email? Do we push to community? Um, and maybe it's all three and it, you know, just depends on what we're trying to do. And then we try to save our human efforts for the things that we're going to drive the biggest um, bang for our buck. So we want to be efficient and we want it to be effective. So we don't want to just reach out to customers just to reach out. Same way as CSM, you know, we always say like, don't just do like the blanket, hey, just checking in. We want to have a purpose for when we're actually talking to a customer one-on-one. -on -one. And so when we first started kind of shifting our focus more to the scaled um, model, um, we had three areas of focus, self-service, one-to-many, and community. Um, and so we tried as much as we could to say, okay, is this going to make an impact on either of these things? And I'll talk about what we did. Um, the first thing that um, I want to talk about is our new user onboarding. So we wanted to tie positive business outcomes. And Marcus mentioned, you know, we really, we don't want to sell features, right? We want to sell outcomes. 
So the first thing that a customer sees when they log into Pendo, um, whether you're a new user of an existing customer or if you're a brand new customer, we want to show you the things that Pendo can do. And so um, pre you're presented with a guide and then depending on the selection, it walks you through some inspiration, some best practices. You can say like, no thanks, I wanna explore on my own, which is fine. Everybody kind of like learns differently. But this is the foundation for all of our educational and risk programs later. Um, and just some very quick stats since we launched this guide, um, we actually had a different onboarding experience and we just you know, refreshed it. So it's really exciting to see that the time to first use of our core events, just a couple of core events that I'm highlighting here, creating a guide and creating a segment, which we can all hopefully agree are like two of like the most important things you can do in Pendo and, and a really big driver of, um, of your, hopefully your outcomes. Um, we significantly reduce the time to that first use by about 50%. And you can also see that the PES of customers who saw this guide is much higher than the users who didn't. So very exciting um, initial results. We launched this, um, we actually tested it with like a cohort of customers and then extended it, but we've seen some success and um, we'll talk more about other things that we've done. Um, this is also new. We have a, a new user onboarding for a specific permission level now. We did not have that before. So this just kind of highlights how using Pendo and you can really get tailored with your segmentation. Um, if you're noticing a lot of support tickets from certain users, um, you can do special onboarding just for them. But similarly, you know, you can see that core event time to first use has significantly decreased as well and engagement is going up. We also have a vibrant community and we really needed our customers, especially those that didn't have a, a named CSM or a dedicated CSM. We wanted them to go to the community to get their questions answered because we really wanted that peer-to-peer -peer engagement. And we wanted people to feel connected to us um, at the brand level because we have an awesome brand. We have a lot of awesome users that are um, ready and waiting in the community to answer your questions. So we pushed new users to um, the community and we use Pendo to say whether or not a customer had visited the community. So again, like all of our, um, programs, we really rely on the data to tell us like, okay, don't email this customer if they are already active in the community, because the next time they see an email from us, they're going to be like, eh, this is, you know, worthless to me. So um, we're always measuring, you know, the effectiveness and you can see this big jump in usage uh, of the community. And you can see it just kind of continues to go up, which is really exciting. Um, so if you're not in the community, you should go. We also do a big push to the academy. Again, having the resources and resource awareness is really important um, for this cohort of customers. And we found that, you know, a lot of the questions that we were answering, you know, in emails were, hey, I'm a new user, I need to know how to use the product, or I'm new, I'm new. And so we created a new user onboarding, um, a new user overview um, webinar that runs. I think it's monthly now. It was bi-weekly at first. And so we just started pushing people to that webinar to say like, hey, we have a webinar, go to it. We also created um, a digital success plan. So customers who you know really want to have a plan and have a way to measure the results, but just don't know where to start. Um, anybody you know can go and learn how to create a success plan. And so that's been awesome. I think we have a 30% um, completion rate on that. And we hope that it helps kind of democratize the knowledge that you know a CSM would have and, and the help that a CSM would give you in creating these success plans and taking that knowledge and giving it to everybody. Um, we also send these education emails based off of the selection from the guide. So again, like that guide is the foundation for everything that we do. So if you select guide new users, for example, we then send you an email with resources, best practices. Um, if you select, I want to explore on my own, we send you kind of like, uh, I guess, more generic best practices and recipes. 
Um, because we know that some people prefer to, you know, learn differently or they just want to like, they don't have time for it right now, but now they have it like a place that they can go in their email that's going to give them best practices and resources to use later. And this is all automated through Pendo segments. Um, intervention guides, this is one where we um, basically using Pendo can see if customers have been with us for, you know, maybe six months more. And if they're, they haven't built any guides, then that's something that's obviously a risk to us. Um, you're not getting some of the key value um, props of Pendo if you're not publishing guides. So we put this guide up that says like, hey, you know, here's why you want to do guides. Here's a video that explains it. Um, and we've actually had 30% um, conversion of customers who saw this guide that had zero guides public that then set a guide live. So we're constantly trying to figure out how can we drive more conversions? If you're not using conversions, this is a really easy way to see, is this impacting the thing that I'm trying to impact? So um, we love conversions. I have a conversion for pretty much every guide that I do. Um, the no login program, um, this one is also um, relatively new, but we are targeting our top risk factor. So obviously if customers aren't logging in, a guide is not going to help. So we send an email that basically says, hey, come back into the product. And um, we have a 90 day follow up. And what happens is if they go, if they click let's go, it takes them right back to that first guide that tells them, hey, what do you want to do? And we'll help you. Um, and so it's really hasn't been running that long. Um, and we've we've seen visitors come back into the product. Actually, since this has gone live, we've actually had five visitors log back in and we want them to keep coming back. So that's something that we're constantly measuring. And for the um, 90 day program, we haven't really seen a lot of success there. It's a different email. So we're tweaking and we're constantly trying to figure out like what can we do to, to drive people back into the product who just, you know, maybe are struggling. Um, I feel like I'm talking really fast. <laughs> um, so the health check is another way that we're trying to kind of create a human humanized experience or an experience that it makes people feel supported um, without actually talking to a person. So this is actually um a guide that is, it's a survey where we we're basically asking customers, what do you need? What, you know, how are you feeling? And we're targeting customers that have like a low health score. And so we're not telling them like, Hey, you're at risk. Like everything you're, everything's bad. Um, because it might not be, but, um, we're basically just nudging and saying, Hey, how can we help? And then depending on what option they, um, they choose, we'll send an email and we're, we're experimenting with um, an over ARR threshold and an under ARR threshold, where if it's over an ARR threshold, you'll get the option to um, talk to a, a human to say like, yeah, I'm lost. I need help. So again, really trying to maximize um, our, our CSM's time in our scaled function because we don't have that many and we have a lot of customers. So these are just some of the ways that we're experimenting with, with that. Um, and then towards the end of the customer life cycle, we introduce the account manager. We just let them know, hey, six months out, I think, from the renewal date. Uh, and then it has a link to their Calendly and it kind of tells them who they are and cute picture with a dog. And so that's really helped um, increase awareness to the folks that they would be speaking to if they have any sort of commercial questions about their renewal, if they want to expand. Um, and anything else that they they may have questions about. So what's next for us? We really are trying to focus on, on value. So those outcomes. So we're thinking about, and I would love actually to hear um, if any of you on the call, right, have maybe done something similar. Like how do you help users realize value at scale? How do we leverage our cross-functional partners to um, drive more expansion for customers that are healthy because we obviously in customer success we're really focused on on risk and retention and then how are users really defining value and that's definitely something I'd love to learn from this group is 
like, what does value mean to you in using the product? <laughs> and I guess I'm like trying to use this group as like research, but I, I'm very interested to hear from this group if anybody would like to share um, some of the things that you're thinking about when it comes to value and, and showing value at scale. And there's a lot of chats, so, oh Lord, I don't know if I, anyway. Yeah, we're all over the place in the chat. Sorry, Eric. <laughs> like, we're talking there's about probably a conversation going on that I'm not. Yeah, mul multiple conversations. But if anybody um wants to re ask a question or put it in there, they could just re um re paste it in the chat or even come off mute and ask it if they if oh, they're feeling great. Right. You can read Liz. Liz added something sure. in there. Okay. Look at guide conversions and show value compared to having devs do all the work. So Liz, if I sent you a, a, a guide or an email that said like, hey, look at all these awesome conversions. Like, do you think that would be beneficial or that would be something you'd be like, oh yeah, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or even sometimes one step guides have higher conversion rates than multi step guides and what does that look like especially as you're designing you know screen tours or onboarding guides you know what's the sweet spot to how you're designing your guides and that impact on customer use and then their future behavior cool um i see a question about the automated email program from jennifer we use Zapier and SendGrid to send our emails. I think what's the, um, so I think there's the question, trying to unpack this question that was in there too. It's like, um, I don't know if you can, you may be able to embed or like look at conversions in a report or dashboard with Data Explorer. I mean, there's a lot you can put with the recent improvements to dashboards and widgets um there's a lot you can put in a dashboard so you might i think i mean you can embed just about anything so you might be able to put in conversions i don't know the answer to that though um but i guess what you'd probably be trying to do you would still set conversions for your guide and to measure guide effectiveness but i think if i were uh trying to change a group of users behavior I might use goals or I might try to like, I don't know if conversions in the dashboard would be the right tool. I would probably measure something else. I would probably want to track that specific behavior, you know, versus the conversion, because the conversion is going to tell you guide effectiveness, the uh, report that maybe you build in Data Explorer and put into your dashboard is going to help you measure that behavior change. Talk, feel free to call me out if that does not <laughs> add up, but I think that's how I think about that. Um, I was just going to say, so like our, we'll do a guide. This is a great presentation, by the way, but um, they'll want to do a guide for low feature adoption. And I'm constantly getting asked on performance mm -hmm. of said conversion. And I don't think unless it's been added in the past couple of weeks that you can track conversion status in a dashboard. So I have to man, like just manually tell them like, oh, it's at 10% or whatever. Um, that, that was the basis of my question. It'd be just really great if we could put it in a report or something ah. in a dashboard, like based on this, like we're doing this campaign. These are the guides we did around it. These are the conversions just so it's all in one place. Got it. Okay. So you're, so in that, in that instance, you just want to, you do want to track and share guide effectiveness. And so you just want to put it in a dashboard. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'm glad you've already explored it. I'm happy to share that with um, the product team. It should agree. It should be in there. Yeah. I also think like the question is of like, what's a good conversion, right? But to me, like, I, I'm not a data scientist. I'm just like a CS manager. And I'm like, anything over zero is great. <laughs> you know, like the fact that we got even just one person to do this thing is feels like a win, especially if that one thing is critical to like retention. But I agree, like sometimes it's hard. You get a lot of like, well, how do you know if that's successful? And I think you just have to start somewhere. And the fact that you can use conversions, which is on the guide details page, um, if you're new, 
um, it, you can basically just set like, what was the goal of this guide, for example, like for the use case of the, um, you know, publishing a guide, the action is, did they publish a guide after? And, you know, if yes, it counts that as a conversion. So that's been really cool to be able to see the effectiveness of, of those guides. Yes. And there's, there's always, um, you know, if you, re- if you really need to figure out like, yeah, like, is this guide creating the, the behavior change that I want it to, you can run, you can use experiments, which will then create like, you know, a control group who doesn't see the guide and then compare their behavior versus people who do see the guide in a very uh, statistic, I can't even, I can't ever say it, statistically significant way. Um, but for the most part, like that's, that's usually like, the, the, when that use case arises, that is the, when you have to figure it out, experiments is the right tool for it. But I would, I think most of the time conversions is kind of the better solution. Um, you just have to create internal benchmarks, you know, because everybody's different. And so it's good to get a, an idea of like, okay, um, you know, and then, and then, and it also just creates like a behavior change too internally. Um, every guide should have a conversion. Every guide should be measured against like the, a conversion rate. That's like a standard. And you build that into your best practices. You know, a lot of companies have a center of excellence for guides, or maybe even just like a deck or a PDF where it's like, Hey, here's how best practices for creating guides put in that best practices, like use, use conversions. If you're seeing a really bad conversion rate, like, you know, based on the benchmark you have for other guides, then you should probably get rid of that guide because it's just creating noise for your users or you should change it. Um, And like Liz was saying, like, uh, you know, um, it's not rocket science, but sometimes like you have to have, if you're creating a guide to change a specific behavior, maybe it's just a one or two step guide where you're really trying to make sure that people do something specific. Um, because yeah, if you have guides that are too long, that conversion rate is going to be really low and, and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. And I love it because like, you know, in, uh, I'm just, I'm a marketer and like email and ads, like there's always conversions and it's just a built in like thing that we do when we think about how to measure the effectiveness of those. And I think it's just a really good motion to have for um um guides too and caitlin if it doesn't you have a question here around like your product team is oh wait was it caitlin Lin, linda so you're asking about and you may not be sure what we're talking about basically like when you create a guide any guide there's an option in the guides um creation the the guide page where it allows you to set a conversion and that conversion is just like you, because we have analytics and guides, you can track the behavior of people after they experience the guide. So you say, okay, I want this guide to help I'm creating this guide to make it easier to create a report. And I want to see if after people see this guide, do they then go on and create this report? And so you're trying to set a conversion of like a conversion event and then track that conversion. Yeah, I'm just sharing the example again. Um of like what it looks like and it's on the um guide details page awesome <clears throat> perfect well thank you um i know that there is um i really love the interaction so i appreciate that and um just Erica, I know that like you showed showcased all of the things that have been working well is there ever a time that you've tried something and it, it hasn't worked um, yes. <laughs> and that's why I love to call everything an experiment because it allows you kind of to fail fast and move on and iterate. Um, I think the first thing is with the new user overview webinar, that was such a huge success that we were like, what else could we do? So we did, um, we wanted to try an installation webinar and we had just for context, we had like hundreds of people show up to our new user overview webinar. We had four, four people show up to the install (laughs) webinar. So we did all the same like marketing kind of thing, you know, driving awareness to it. And so we were like, okay, well, we have the recording, we put it in the community and that's where that's going to go from here on out. And we're like, never again. So we learned our lesson that not all things um, (laughs) need a webinar. 
<laughs> Love that. Well, thank you both for presenting. I'm going to do a few little wrap up slides. So if you have any questions, um, Marcus and Erica can be in here to answer any sort of questions that you may have. Um, but let me just um, go ahead and get started on a, or finish up on a few things. Um, so we did talk about a lot of different things, and um, I was really excited about all the questions that people had about ADOPT. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can utilize Pendo, and so if you do have any questions, uh, our CSMs are wonderful. I actually counted today, and 11 of them joined us on the call. So if you have questions, please utilize them. Um, they are excellent resource, and they can, can make sure that you, um, if you have additional questions on what ADOPT was, how you could use it, um, they are happy to provide more details for you. And uh, Pendo user groups, uh, we are kicking them off and I'm super excited about them. Um, we hosted our first in person in New York uh, last month and we had a really great turnout. Um, I don't have any sort of like registration details, but we do just wanna do a little save the dates that we are making a stop in Texas with our user groups. Um, Dallas and Austin. So Austin, we're going to have um, events slated for January 10th and then uh, Dallas in January 11th. So if you are located in one of those markets, um, just put a little calendar hold at, from 5 to 6.30 and um, just know that details to register will be coming soon. And um, you know, a lot of you who attend this uh, event, which I'm like so excited that I get to be the host of it, are a lot of our power users and um, you really utilize Pendo to the fullest. And we want to make sure that if you are referring a friend to the program that you actually compensated for it. So um, we do have a refer a friend program. So if you have anybody else in the customer success field or a product manager who really could utilize Pendo, um, you can help them get a raise by uh, getting Pendo in their, um, in their product. So um, just know that that's available and you can learn more at pendo.io slash refer a friend. And um, we, this has kind of been, I maybe, I'm, I'm not sure when the anniversary of this is, but I do feel like Mind the Product um, and us have combined forces and they, we do have a 50% off discount code as a Pendo customer that you can join um, to get a discount as their memberships. Um, they have a lot of great content and thought leadership that you can join um, over there. Oh, great. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I, like I said, it is recorded. I'm going to stop it right